Hi, I'm Kim Palliser, and you're listening to the Tomorrow with Rovio podcast. Hi, everyone, and welcome to a very special episode of the Tomorrow with Rovio podcast. This is the first time that we're going to try and do this uh, as a video as well. So if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, you can see me as opposed to just hear me if you're listening to this on Spotify or, um, you know, Apple Podcast or whatnot. Um, we decided to do video for this one for a few reasons, most to test to see whether or not this is an interesting format for this conversation, but also because our guest today is a really special one. Kim Pallister uh, is the general manager, gaming solutions, services, and worldwide developer relations at Intel. Uh, obviously, Intel does a ton for gaming, um, whether it be desktops or um, data centers. The work that they've done on, you know, chipsets for, you know, AR, VR, all of that sort of stuff. Intel is very, very plugged into where gaming is going. Uh, and so we thought to sort of celebrate that uh, video might be an interesting option. Also, as you'll see in this interview, Kim and I know each other and go way, way back. Um, and because of that, we thought it would be fun to be able to see each other and kind of enjoy each other's virtual company a little bit. Hopefully you'll get a kick out of that as well. So uh, please sit back, enjoy another episode of the Tomorrow Worth Rovio podcast, this time with Kim Pallister. I hope you dig it. Thanks. All right, uh, Kim, great to see you again. Um, and uh, we've been looking forward to this conversation for weeks now. Uh, offline, obviously, you and I know each other. We sort of backed and forth about who was going to set it up. So we agreed it was going to be you. So you get to tell everyone why you and I know each other. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, I'm super excited to be here. Thanks for for having me on. Uh, and, and you know, as part of the banter back and forth, I said, I, I'm only coming on if I'm going to tell the story about how we uh, know yours. each other. So as your as your kind of uh, uh, star has risen in the in the games <laughs> industry and I've seen your name around I've said hey uh, that guy wouldn't be in the games industry if it wasn't for me and the reason is that I uh, was uh, 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 friends with your older sister when we were in college and me and some of our friends would go uh, hang out at your house uh, you know uh, Ben's mom was known as the cool mom that would kind of like talk to you like you were an adult and we could, you know, smoke cigarettes in her house and, <laughs> and shoot the breeze about, you know, whatever was, whatever was kind of uh, in the news that day. And, uh, and at one point, because I was uh, studying computer science, she asked me, uh, Hey, uh, you know, uh, my, my younger son, Ben is uh, asking me about getting like a Nintendo, but I was thinking about getting him a computer. What do you think? And I said, you should get him a computer because not only can he play games on it, but he'll be able to, uh, uh, you know, modify them and and write his own at some point, and and you know the the games will be a pathway into technology. And then I remember her getting you an Amiga, mm -hmm. and I was jealous because I had a C sixty four, and I said, hey, don't get him a computer better than mm -hmm. mine. But uh, and then and then you know uh, at at some point later we uh, you know uh, our paths crossed and then one day I was like at a conference and you were like uh, keynoting something on behalf of Ubisoft <laughs> when you were there so you know I said hey that that probably wouldn't have happened if I hadn't planted it that seed at you. some point and so. actually the two other steps to that the first was on the Amiga I mean I just played games right pirated games. Shh. But I just played games. But then eventually we got a, a 486 DX250 with eight megabytes of RAM and a 288K baud modem. Uh, so I was like absolutely next gen in terms of my, my hardware. Um, and I insisted on the eight megs of RAM because I knew I needed it to play the latest and greatest. But that is mm -hmm. where I actually started, you know, messing around with my first game modding. I mean, I remember hacking right. into the hex code of shareware RPGs in order to give myself, you know, more XP yeah. and, you know, that sort of stuff and playing with Doom Quake mods and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So it, you were right. You really were right. Like the fact that I was PC first rather than console first really was the, 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 the journey for me in, in that respect towards kind of working in games. And I would say the second step is, you worked at Matrox, right? And you had graduated right. and I was still in university. And I looked up to you in a big way as someone who had made it. Like you were in, as far as I was concerned, you were in games. And I remember reaching out to you for advice about sort of like, how do I kind of follow in your footsteps? 
And I think it's safe to say that the fact that you were in computer science heavily influenced me to do computer science. And, and so, you know, I don't regret that either. Well, thanks. Yeah. And, and at, at that point in time, there weren't many options in Montreal. If you want to do something games related, it was either Matrox or maybe Soft Image or, you know, Ubisoft was just starting to kind of uh, put some uh, uh, investment and some, some headcount yeah. <laughs> there uh, outside, of, outside of Paris. So How the times have go. changed. Okay, well, um, you and I could spend hours reminiscing. Uh, hopefully, we'll get a chance to do more of that and catching up. But let's jump into the meat. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, I, I've got my questions broken into three, I think, high-level chunks. Um, I'd like to start by going over sort of life at Intel and, and what your role is at Intel and that sort of thing in order to better understand how Intel fits into the ecosystem of the future of gaming and the future of entertainment. And then we can dive into some of the specific topics. So can you describe the sort of limits or the edges, I guess, of Intel's gaming group? Like every time I hear you talk or I read something, you're talking about a team, you know, I've got a team working on this, I've got a team working on that. It's not clear to me sort of how many teams there are, how big that group sure. is, and I guess how many yeah, irons you guys have in the fire. Hey, I'm I'm <laughs> I'm inside and it's not clear to me some days, right? But uh, <laughs> the um the, the long and short of it is uh, I mean I've I've been here a while, I've I've done a variety of different roles. Uh, I'm the general manager of what we call the gaming solutions team, which is kind of the game developer account management and we run a lot of the programs that uh, uh, you know work with developers to um, showcase the latest and greatest features that we're bringing on our different uh, products and then, uh, you know, uh, help market those and kind of reward those developers for working with us and kind of uh, help take them to market. And we've got some some programs on, on that side of doing it, right? But in terms of uh, uh, Intel's role in gaming, we're obviously a technology company. We build... Uh, you know, we're probably best known by most consumers for, you know, our, our core processors and um, that, that go into all the uh, gaming notebooks and, and desktops or a large number of them. Um, we also obviously make a lot of the silicon that goes into the data centers from the big cloud right. providers or into the back ends that uh, different studios uh-huh. are running for their, their on-prem uh, solutions. And so that's another piece of kind of the, you know, gaming related revenue that we get that that consumers don't necessarily have a view of and um ultimately you know both of those platforms benefit greatly from kind of uh being open platforms and having kind of open development so there's a lot that we do in things that are kind of uh on the periphery of game development around uh API development and industry standards and uh you know from folks like uh Kronos group you know there was a uh when when I was running the VR team here we were you know involved in the uh open XR development as a, as an example mm-hmm. there right um so you know I would say that uh there's a lot of different product teams that uh have products that that you know realize the significance of gaming to their businesses and and how okay. it's both a uh, both a large money maker but also a, a big part of what pushes technology forward and kind of always has been right it's always been that thing that that course, uh, gets yeah. people to to kind of push the cutting edge and then we look at you know uh we, we consider ourselves you know one of the stewards of the pc platform and so we have to think about a lot of platform uh, a lot of problems that aren't just um limited to specific products, but kind of how do we move the ball forward for everybody? How do we kind of lift all boats, right? So that's that's okay. kind of the long and short of it. And it's, and it's not just oh, done within great. one team, it's done across a number of organizations. And, and so, like, you mentioned a few different teams or verticals. I mean, yeah. you talked about desktop, you talked about, you know, headsets and VR, you talked about cloud, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, d- does, does, does Intel measure them, like, I guess in different, because in one way, there's like a very basic way to measure it. It's like, are we selling more chips? Like if we're selling more chips, then this, this work is paying off. Yeah. But some things you were talking about, like stewardship, right? Like right. It, it's harder to kind of measure stewardship as it relates to selling chips. So do you guys have different success metrics for different teams? Is there anything there that, that 
that, that you can share? Yeah, I, I, I think uh, I obviously can't share numbers, but you're on obviously, the right yeah, you're yeah. on the right track. That there's like a, a portion of our business that's like, okay, how much do we, uh, you know, how much revenue are we making selling products into, you know, OE, OEMs, gaming SKUs, right? Yep. Of their of their uh, notebooks and desktops, and then there are other uh, things that we kind of uh, just through the kind of long history, we understand like, hey. Uh, what, you know, uh, maybe less gaming related, although partially gaming related, even, you know, standards like USB, we'd say we understand that the ability for people to connect peripherals in a easy to use way and move data around at higher speed and it kind of make the, the platform as a whole easier to use, uh, encourages people to make use of that platform. It, it, uh, you know, delights them more. And so we would invest in a standard like that. Whether or not we kind of said, oh, well, we're, you know, we're not a maker of USB mice. And so why are we doing right. this? Right. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of things like that that we're doing that we're just saying, hey, this is what's expected of the latest and greatest platform. So to kind of keep the industry rolling along, we have to invest there. Um, and then there's a piece where we'll look at kind of, uh, you know, market research and talk to partners and kind of just gauge the health of the business and and uh, from their side, like, you know, how much software is being sold and uh, how are developers feeling about our platforms. And we have kind of uh, both on the business and, and kind of technical and architecture side, you know, uh, advisory boards and partners we work with where we kind of hear like, okay, what are you, what are you most worried about? What problems do you want us to be working on over the next few years? That kind of thing. So th those are all okay. kind of things we're moving the needle on a little bit. Yeah. A lot. <laughs> so, yeah. so a lot of different fronts. Sure. But, and yet the, the one thing I've, I've, I've heard you talk about, which was really interesting to me, um, was this idea of like developing a proof of concept or, or working yeah. with a partner to solve a particular problem, which to me feels, you know, maybe not necessarily purely software, but definitely kind of more in the bridge between hardware and software. So, and, and yet I think when most people think Intel, they, you know, they probably think primarily hardware. Um, is there anything there that you can share about kind of when you guys look at some of the software side of things and sort of what this proof, these proof of concepts that you would develop are and, and what your expectations are about those? Sure. I mean, the, the whole, uh, uh, reason that Intel has, you know, uh, thousands of software engineers, right? And, and we realize that at the end of the day, the silicon is worth nothing if it doesn't provide some kind of function, right? And, and there are, right. you know, obviously, uh, teams working on drivers and bias and some pockets of kind of application development. Uh, we do a lot of tools development, uh, for things like VTune and our graphics performance analyzer and stuff like that, 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 uh, developers use. But most of the time, if we say, uh, this kind of functionality has to, realize itself in the market, we say it has to show up in a software application in some time. And that means going and working with partners and with the experts in the space where, uh, you know, if we want to see something realized in a game, we're not going to go ramp up a game studio to do it. Right. That that's, uh, right. uh, our most likely path to market there is to say, okay, let's go engage with the people that know what they're doing in terms of game development and let's, you know, bring the best of our strengths together. Right. And so, that will sometimes go right into like, hey, the path here is clear. Let's get support for, you know, function A, Y, uh, X, Y, Z into the next uh, version of your application. And other times if it's more like, hey, we, there's something interesting to explore here, but we, we need to prove that it can be done. Well, that's where you do like proof of concept as a first stage towards that, right? So um, uh, a, a, a timely, interesting example is um, we you know, we're looking at kind of uh, problems facing the industry, problems facing uh, end users a, a couple of years back okay. within the gaming space. So we heard that uh, uh, toxicity in online games was mm -hmm. kind of a frequently cited uh, frustration point and problem for users. We knew that it was going to require a lot of different kind of industry participation and uh, solutions involving uh, game design, community design, stuff like that. We said, I wonder if uh, technology could be part of the of the solution. And we said, okay, 
you know, we have ideas about how this could work, but we don't know the the, the space very well. We talked to a couple of companies uh, working in the space of kind of a detection of, a, yep. uh, you know, foul language and uh, toxic behavior and this like that. And we did a, um, we did a, a, a proof of concept with a company called Spirit AI. Yep. Two years ago at GDC, we showed that proof of concept saying, hey, we wondered whether we could take Intel's uh, uh, speech-to-text technology and marry it with their toxicity in text chat and see whether it would actually function or not. And we demonstrated that two years ago as like, look, we're actually detecting stuff using AI in kind of this like Petri dish kind of uh, proof of concept example, right? And then uh, we kept working with them and actually at the uh, GDC showcase keynote that'll be debuting or you know probably before this podcast airs um we uh, are are showing the product that's coming out of that which is an application uh the working name we're giving it is called uh, bleep and uh, it's now that's a functional <laughs> thing that does uh yeah it, because that's what it does it yep. does re- uh, if you think of the old sitcom uh kind of bleeping of uh of certain language uh it does real time uh, detection and redaction yeah. And uh, we're entering a beta with that. So again, taking a cautious path if we're going to test it out with uh, users, get feedback on it, uh, you know, make, make sure it's doing uh, what was aimed at. But that's an example of taking, a, you know, a, a risky kind of a, awesome. a forward-looking idea, doing a proof of concept, and then furthering it out into product development. So um, uh, it can, you know, it, it seems to be for the world like AI is still buzzy, and you know, you see all these kind of cool new uses and lots of people talking about it. Um, Certainly tech and gaming is, you know, obviously at the forefront. Uh, are there some like right here, right now uses of AI uh, that in gaming or other that you personally find the most interesting and compelling? And then the flip side of that question is, are there, you know, some things that you think inside the next five year horizon uh, where you think AI has the potential to, to really do some amazing stuff, but it's, it's kind of not yet there. It's still work in development. Sure. I think that, um, w- you know, one thing that maybe is uh, in, in a way less kind of uh, sexy because it's not immediately apparent to the, the consumer is like, you, you're probably seeing this a ton in development, right? Like people using AI for kind of uh, generating uh, content or assisting artists in, uh, in, in, in generating stuff more quickly that yeah. they can then sift through. Um, automated testing, uh, doing kind of, um, you know, whether it's from like a gameplay standpoint and using, you know, uh, uh, masses of, of bots for yeah. uh, uh, testing and things like that, or whether it's just like uh, testing mobile games against, you know, thousands of different mm-hmm. uh, headsets in an automated fashion. All of that kind of like, uh, call it kind of AI grunt work mm-hmm. is like grunt helping work a good word for it. Uh, control the exploding costs of game development, right? So while it's not immediately apparent that I pick up a game and say, hey, wow, there's it's doing something different because AI, what it means is like more bigger, f- you know, fabulous looking games coming without, you know, uh, uh, budgets that are always, you know, uh, creeping upwards towards a billion dollars, right? Um, so that's that's one area. And then uh, the, the most kind of immediate thing on the uh, consumer side is like there has been a, um, uh, you know, a, a well-trod path, let's say, on using AI for the processing of uh, video and audio. Those are obviously, you know, like mm-hmm. a 2D media that you can, uh, you know, do, do training in fairly obvious fashions to recognize such things. And so... I think we'll see an increasing amount of kind of uh, using that for the things around games, for whether it be uh, voice chat, like uh, noise reduction or voice translation, Mm -hmm. the anti-toxicity stuff that we're doing that's not directly uh, in the game itself, but helping improve the quality of the experience. Similarly, on the like game streaming side, we'll see the uh, ability to kind of you know, improve quality of the video, uh, uh, recognize things that are going on and, and affect behaviors in, uh, in different ways. Even stuff as simple as like doing, you know, uh, higher quality automatic kind of uh, background removal instead of having to have a, a green screen there. Yeah, particularly um, those across are, those the... Those are some, yeah. 
uh, particularly like across the video or the whole stream, like that would just be fantastic. Cause right now it is a little clanky, clunky still, you know, trying to, you know, like either frame by frame remove it or you've got to green screen it or something like that. So I, I would love to be able to just on this stream say, make that go away. Right. And then boom, yeah. AI would take care of the rest of it. That kind of thing. Yeah. Is, and then I, I think sure. we'll see a, uh, a, a ton of stuff over the long term in the, uh, more kind of in the core of the games itself and, yeah. and developers and designers trusting the AI to do things <laughs> in the game that happen after it's left the studio and mm-hmm. it's in the end user's hands. But that is a little bit, uh, I have a kind of personal, uh, uh, you know, uh, gut hunch that it, it's a little bit like we saw the adoption of like real time physics okay. in games. And it kind of took like a decade, right. right? Of of the the initial uh, very very kind of initial thing being, well, I don't want the simulation exploding, or a, a designer saying, well, I w- I want it to look realistic, but I want it to behave in exactly the way That's I right. envision in my deterministic mind, deterministic right? realistic, <laughs> it, it, exactly. And and then they realized over a period of time that they could have some tools to have some amount of control on it, and that the emergent natural looking behavior or, or natural behavior was worth the cost or the risk of kind of letting go a little bit. Yep. And I think there'll be a path like that with AI where 10 years from now, we'll say, okay, can, can you imagine we used to script out all that dialogue by hand? Yeah. Ha ha ha. That yeah. was silly. You know, maybe it won't be that it'll be something else, but it'll be a long, a long and slow uh, road. And I, your, your point there, I think is a really interesting one. I, I, we have a, an episode of this podcast coming out in the next couple of months with um, someone deep into AI, deep into the use of AI inside of video games, mm-hmm. really interesting sort of angle and insight there. And, and, and his, his thoughts really echoed what you're just saying, whereby it was really about, um, it's a whole new way of designers thinking, right? And, and mm-hmm. as long as they try and control it the way they control their scripting languages or whatever, we're only getting a tiny little fraction of what it can do. And once they learn to kind of let go and design collaboratively with the AI, then you can start to see some really interesting new experiences beginning to appear. And it kind of sounds like you're saying the same thing, whereby for now it's a tool, maybe it's a co-production tool, Promethean AI, that kind of thing, where it's kind of like supporting the artist's capability of working. But then there's this whole new world that can come when we, we kind of let go a little bit and put it out there as a feature and see yeah, that's right. Yeah. And and it'll take, you know, that that time of people doing kind of iterative yeah. experiments and, hey, did you see what that game did? That was neat. What if I did this one twist on it? Yeah. It'll also require like uh, whole new generations of like debugging yeah. tools and like, uh, why did it behave that way? I don't know. We trained the model. We don't know what's going yeah. on now. Because you know? AI. So it, it'll be interesting to watch. Yeah. That's uh, right. AI Dungeon is a really fun one for that where, yeah, it, it, it the emergent experiences that come because it's basically just GPT three writ in a video game um, is is really right. interesting. I've had a lot of fun playing with that um, and and playing yeah. with friends too, where you kind of playing off of each other and it's just going absolutely crazy. Um, right. Uh, okay, that was great. I love that answer. Um, you also talked about um, sort of the silicone in you know data centers, which you know dot 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 gets to cloud and. So dot, dot, dot gets to cloud gaming. Um, can you help us frame? Well, interestingly enough, I actually haven't talked to anyone deeply about cloud gaming on this podcast yet. So I'm wondering if you could kind of frame it for people, sort of basically what is cloud gaming? How does it work? You know, uh, super high sure. level. Yeah, so there, <laughs> there's a, uh, you know, uh, an interesting kind of uh, call it cloud gaming 101 or a first level of, of discussion or debate that happens where uh, you know the people that have been in the in the industry for some time realize yeah like lots of games have some portion that runs in the cloud yeah. we do matchmaking and leaderboards and server hosting and things like this right so that uh, there are very few games that aren't cloud enabled or that right. don't have a one one foot in the cloud kind of thing these days right uh what most people in the past couple of years uh also 10 years back as, <laughs> as there was kind of a wave back then the uh, are talking about <laughs> is this is this idea of like what if i run the kind of beefy part of the simulation in a computer in the cloud and just stream you frames 
can I then, you know, basically deliver a, a, a high-end experience on uh, a, some kind of very thin device? Mm-hmm. Or can I deliver a more kind of a controlled experience where I don't have to worry about, you know, hardening the client against cheaters, or I don't have to worry about, uh, you know, ranges of compatibility issues, right? And so, you know, uh, at, at the end of the day, uh, as I mentioned earlier, like we sell, you know, a, a lot of hardware into data centers, we sell a lot into clients. And so, you know, uh, uh, ultimately, the, both of these are good for some part of our, uh, some part of our business. And I think the thing that is most exciting about the potential, and then I'll talk about some of the challenges, is just um, more ways to get more games into more people's hands is a good thing. Yeah. There might be some growing pains where people figure out a certain business model isn't viable or a certain kind of uh, mix of offering isn't resonating with consumers. And so some people will try things and fail and some people will find things that work. And at the end of the day, it's, uh, you know, uh, uh, all of those experiments will go- are good and will yield, you know, uh, uh, certain things that will work and will say, oh, that's an interesting way to, to deliver that, yeah. right? So like we've had... Um, uh, some some friends of ours at, at Tencent that have been using you know Intel hardware for cloud gaming to kind of like uh, uh, supporting wide ranges of mobile phones for uh, games that you know on the latest and greatest mobile phone uh, they run fine mm-hmm. but like there's you know a massive variation in handsets out there yeah. that in the past it was just too hard so they basically say hey below a certain version or for all these models out here, we just stream frames, right? And for their mix of thing, it's, uh, you know, uh, not not as uh, high-end an experience as, let's say, streaming, you know, cyberpunk mm-hmm, to, mm-hmm. Uh, you know, a device where you might have UI issues, et cetera. So, you know, it's it's got potential. It's obviously, you know, you get headlines both when a big player kind of uh, takes a, a stab in the space or, you know, naysayers uh, pointing at the, anybody that's, you know, uh, trips up or fails or, or falls short on a promise. Yeah. But, you know, ultimately, it like any kind of uh, new things in this business, they don't, you know, upend the world and replace everything else. They become a new thing that takes uh, takes its place alongside the others as like, yeah, for certain players, this is a way that they get certain games and that's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. And um, one of the things that I think is so interesting about cloud gaming is, is as you said, there's, there's these, these epochs, right? So like there's, there was the epoch, there is the epoch where effectively everyone has something in the cloud, right? Then there's this epoch where we kind of currently sit or sat maybe where it was kind of like, let's stream AAA to your iPhone, right? So you've got your mm-hmm. Stadia's in there, you've got your GeForce Now's in there, uh, you know, whatever, Luna, et cetera. Like, so there's a variety of people who are sort of like, okay, we're going to, we're going to take AAA and access the next billion gamers because you're going to be able to play these triple games, AAA games everywhere. Obviously, there's been some challenges there across a variety of fronts. You know, is there consumer demand for it? Does the business model work? You know, do you actually still have to have something super high end, i.e. network connectivity? Like there's been the challenges there. Then there's this sort of third epoch or third generation that people seem to talk about, right? Which is, you know, these kind of cloud native experiences. Like if you're designing for Mm -hmm. the cloud, you're not necessarily going to design Cyberpunk 2077, you're going to design something else that's probably a little bit more distributed experience, probably a little bit more, you know, bite size, probably cross platform, probably benefits from the sort of instant in, instant out. Like it's just going to be different. It's not going to be a single monolithic experience. And yet we haven't really seen a ton of stuff there. I mean, there's people poking at it, you know, there's the rival peak thing, which is like kind of adjacent. And like, there's some experiences there, but I wouldn't say like, I can point to like a third gen cloud native gaming success story. Do you have any thoughts about what the holdup to that is? Like, what do you think is, why, why do you think we haven't seen that yet? If, if theoretically the technology is there? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I mean, if I if I knew what the the answer was, I'd you know go take a bunch of uh, <laughs> in, investment money and and be the next uh, you know big big entrepreneur in the space. So uh, 
I, I think there are people or, or, you know, efforts where people take kind of a moonshot type approaches. They have a big idea and they, and they, you know, go get the investment and try and make a run of it. And then there are people that iterate, um, you know, that, that either iterated like poking at the edges, as you put it, or trying small things. Here's a, you know, conservative game that uh, has, has demonstrating something interesting. Like I remember it kind of the, the, uh, dawn of uh, kind of, uh, let's say, you know, higher speed uh, multiplayer, mm-hmm. you know, fairly significant multiplayer experiences. There were a few companies that were trying things that were like, hey, we're going to have like a, a hundred players on the server at the same time, but we're not doing like a big first person shooter. We're going to do kind of, you know, asteroids, right? right? And we're going to have like 2D with spaceships flying around. Like that's enough for us to figure out this latency stuff. And then there, you know, there were some experiments that worked there, right? Um, so I, I, I'm not sure what kind of the, the the magic answer will be. I think it'll come from some mix of somebody iterating something yeah. and, and seeing, hey, this thing here really resonated with people or this particular feature is now like, a proven new twist that you can enable with the cloud. Right, and so right, let's right. go put that into our next version of our big uh, uh, shooter title or what have you. So, yeah. you know, it, it'll be interesting to see what comes out of all that. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm super anxious to, to see where that goes. And it, it, mm-hmm. it ties into, it, 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 it ties into this other sort of trend that I think we see a lot of these days, which is cross platform. Um, and, and, you know, it's hard to point to a like top seller in 2020 or like top seller, a, a top played game that isn't cross platform in some way, shape or form, whether it be a Fortnite or a Roblox or a Minecraft or an Among sure. Us. I mean, you, you know, there's Fall Guys, which is a little bit different, but, but generally speaking, you know, cross platform is becoming more and more common, which makes the, the, the walls of the platform, the sort of walls of the walled garden start to feel a little bit blurrier to me. Uh, and and yeah. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts. Do you spend any time thinking about the platforms and the walls of the gardens and cross-platform and kind of where where that's going? Yeah, sure. I, I mean, we, we you know, we have to think about where, uh, you know, develop our own opinions, often wrong, right? so, sometimes <laughs> right, about least where you have games an are going. you got to start from That's something. right. Um, <clears throat> about where games are going because we have to think about, okay, ultimately, what's that going to mean for the PC version of this game running on a PC or what's it going to mean for our data center in the cloud? And I think that one of the more, you know, interesting kind of... Uh, domains in which to kind of ruminate about this stuff is like ultimately it's the collision of the of the the business factors with the technology that ends up pushing some interesting areas yes. right so the uh trend the trend towards cross platform that you're talking about kind of stems out of two things right one is uh stuff that is uh multiplayer and that is dependent on kind of like a degree of engagement, the size of audience and how often and for how long those people are engaged, right? You get like a network effects uh, type of thing. And the other thing is like born out of kind of the free to play model of like, if I develop a game that ultimately is kind of a service and I'm engaging you for a period of time and the longer you're engaged, the more value you're seeing and the more likely you are to spend money, then it becomes you know interesting to me to say, well, how can I reach you at all points yeah. in the day? Never leave, uh, and mm. and 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 always you know be be at the ready, right? And so if you look at uh, you know a, a non gaming example of Netflix, right? The the fact that Netflix is a, available across such a wide variety of devices means you can have a show you watch in the evening. You might have something you you know watch while you're on public transit and and watch a you know a, a, a segment of a you know, reality show or what have you. And that the overall value you see for for engaging with that service, whether it be a subscription or money spent otherwise, accumulates, yeah. right? So, uh, you know, uh, F- Fortnite's a, a great kind of poster child example where it's like, it's a great experience across devices. They've sunk a lot of time into making that play uh, elsewhere. And then, you know, when when we look at that and and just would think, okay, 
Whereas in the past, we would just think about, you know, how do we uh, make the game uh, shine as best possible on the latest platform? That's still a uh, consideration. Mm -hmm. We'll also be thinking, okay, what are developers faced with in terms of challenges of making this experience scale, oh, cool. making it uh, uh, shine on our platform while they also run on a phone or what have you? Those are, uh, you know, things that start to have an effect that ultimately stemmed out of the business side, but result in like technical challenges. Right? Yeah. 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 Very interesting. I mean, <laughs> I'm glad to hear you say, um, not say, oh, well, we're just going to make sure that it's always the best it can possibly be on PC and forget everyone else. Um, because well, we're going to do that too. But. <laughs> <laughs> but you didn't say forget everyone else. You, you know, yeah. you acknowledge no, and, that. And I, I mean, exist. it's it's interesting. You said uh, you you said you know make it the best on on PC and like what best constitutes for for one person over another. Like, uh, well, even even for a single person means different things yeah. at different times, no, right? Like, uh, uh, I, I had this discussion with uh, my my younger son when his. Uh, Friends and him were at a lacrosse match out of town, and I was like, I, you know, I thought you enjoyed playing uh, Fortnite, uh, you know, on on the PC because it was best. And he was like, it's best on this thing because it's here. Yeah, exactly. Like I, my phone's in my pocket yeah. and I'm outdoors, yeah. you know. So best is a different thing at different times. The best camera you have is the one you have on you, right? Or yeah, right, right. exactly. No, that that's great, and I I think that's bang on. Um, uh, switching gears to another major thread that I, I wanted to talk about, which is the sort of mixed reality AR VR thread. Sure. Um, you gave this great talk a couple of years back, your vision of gaming talk. Um, can you, can we like rip it off? Can you like give a TLDR version of that? And I can just kind of piggyback yeah, off yeah, of sure. that because it was awesome. So, uh, it, 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 thank you. Uh, it was um, uh, a talk I gave at uh, the AWE Expo. It's actually, people can look it up. It's on YouTube. I can give you the link later. But uh, the, the idea was, um, and this is part of what we'll do with kind of uh, concept work to kind of think about, okay, what uh, w what kind of things might happen and what, might they imply in terms of the the technical implications so that we can start to think about okay what what problems would we need to decompose and think about what the the technical building blocks are yep. for that right and so the idea was that i took a um uh, I, I, I strung together a bunch of kind of vignettes in a kind of, uh, you know, day of a person's life where, you know, gaming was, uh, gaming and AR and VR were touching them in different ways. And a lot of the concepts were kind of, uh, uh, lifted out of like favorite science fiction works and stuff. Uh, uh, you know, Lady of Mazes or a Halting State or a couple of books that I, I borrowed from. And, um, uh, there you go. You know, fantastic, right? So uh, there's a, a bit in the opening of that book where uh, her uh, it, it's actually both a, a AR but also AI uh, a, a little vignette that they do where uh, her uh, social network pops up around her as a little kind of little kind of cartoon versions of her friends. Mm -hmm. uh, so I kind of did that where they were like you know, running around on your breakfast table while you were kind of, you know, eating your, your bowl of cornflakes or what have you. And, um, and, and the, the more interesting thing of that bit was the idea that you had kind of an AI stand in. And so that if you logged on to, you know, your future Facebook and uh, uh, Kim was offline, you could still have a real time conversation with him. And it was, you know, his AI stand in and you didn't, really didn't care whether it was really him or the stand-in because the stand-in was good enough that, you know, if you are if you had an argument with my AI, well, then you must you have been had wrong. You would an argument with me, the perfect know, my, digital twin. That, that's, it, it, it's exactly it, right? So there, that's an example of something that was lifted from there. So, you know, it, it was really meant to kind of uh, stimulate some discussion, which it's uh, done. It wasn't anything regarding kind of specific products we were building, but it did make us think about, okay, well, what are the challenges in kind of, uh, you know, uh, wireless technologies if you want to make something light and be able to walk around your house? How might you, uh, you know, what, what standards issues come into play if you want to have a headset that works with one device? And then when you you know, get on public transit and it has some kind of a, an in-vehicle entertainment system that you want to connect to automatically, what would need to happen yeah. there? So, yeah, no, it's great. And, and personally, I love the, I love that you did that. And, and I, I almost want to do that like as a, as a, as a chunk of each 
episode that I do on this podcast with the guests is like, I don't know, maybe in the future, I'll save a little five minutes and we'll just kind of like role play one of these little sort of scenarios. Because I think, you know, when you, when you, when you do that, when you say like, okay, so how do we build the hollow deck or how do we build her or how do we mm-hmm. build, you know, whatever. And, 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 and no, don't hand wave it away. Let's talk it through. What tech stack do we have today where that is possible? And what tech stack are we missing today to prevent something like that from becoming possible? What I, what I find really interesting is how much is actually in place today. And of course, there's like core fundamentals, right? Like, you know, the, the holographic projection that's three dimensional that you can walk around that actually isn't completely flickering garbage, but that actually looks sort right. of realistic. Of course, we don't have that, right? But a lot of the other kind of tech we do, right? You know, the voice recognition, the, uh, you know, projection mapping, the uh, three dimensional scanning, a lot of the AI that it would require, uh, you know, a lot of that sort of stuff is either there or is in development in some sort of nascent form. So I love those exercises of trying to, at least in our heads, make real science fiction just as you did and sure. see and where, one that of the, um, where that technology exists. <clears throat> right. And one of the points of that talk was like, there, when you go through that exercise and start to think about, you know, what might the technology look like under the hood, there's kind of uh, uh, two buckets you can put problems in, right? There, there are ones that we say, uh, uh, you know, I'm at Intel, so we think of them as kind of Moore's, Moore's Law problems. Mm-hmm. Like, hey, I don't have enough compute to do that, but I can draw the amount that I'd need and then I can draw a timeline and I can kind of guesstimate when it'll be feasible mm-hmm. to get it at a certain cost or size or power level or what have you. And then there are other problems that are like, this is an unsolved problem. Yeah. This is a design challenge. Yeah. This is an unknown, right? Like uh, one of the things that uh, I find most kind of intriguing about uh, AR and, and this kind of, you know, the longer term vision of the glasses you wear around mm-hmm. as you kind of walk the, the streets of Montreal and uh, hopefully they don't fog up in the cold, right? Or just is, shatter. Um, <laughs> or just shadow, that's right, is, uh, you know, we're used to this model, this kind of application model. We have an operating system on our device, and then we uh, control what context we put that application in or, mm-hmm. or that device in, right? I'm going to now play Angry Birds, that's and right. I have decided I'm going to do it. Well, in AR, like, who decides the context, right? If I, If I'm like, uh, is, is it the company that built the device that is going to decide you're going to see an ad mm-hmm. now and that's it? And what if that ad pops in front of a bus that's heading yeah. my direction? Yeah. Do, is there a safety override? <laughs> Does somebody like, you know, uh, and, and I think that the a, a big hurdle the industry will have to get over is if we build these devices as kind of extensions of the existing model, then the existing kind of operating system paradigm doesn't work, right? And And figuring out that context. So that was an example of like, an interesting challenge there. I said, hey, for the audience there that was largely designers, et cetera, like, think about this. This is the hard stuff, yeah. right? Hey, world, here's a challenge. No, yeah. it was great. I loved it. Yeah. I think it's really neat. I I, I hope you do more. Um, yeah. But talking about AR, XR, um, uh, <clears throat> so one of the areas that fascinates me in that space is the... Um, the input mechanisms. So there's a lot, there's a mm-hmm. lot of focus on this, right? Um, yeah. And now just as of the last, what, couple of weeks, we've started to see this, right? Like with Vive's new right. thing where it's kind of actually starting to, you know, track your face. Of course, you look like Sam Fisher or something, right? You've got this huge <laughs> helmet on, but like, whatever, we'll leave that aside. Right. And then there's dot, 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 dot. And you have mesh, right? Where, I put my glasses on and I turn around and you're there and it's not your head, Mm -hmm. right? It's you with your clothes and your earrings or whatever you might be wearing. And it's like somehow your entire body is scanned and then projected into my field of view. So what other input form factors did you or do you guys think about and did you explore when you were sort of, you know, helping lead, you know, that VR group to help make that kind of thing a reality? Because I can't imagine I'm going to have a network of drones hovering around me, filming me from 360 degrees everywhere I go in life. So how do we capture more than the head in order to start 
creating some of these whatever as, more as futuristic a, uh, visions. As kind of a quick aside, as kind of a quick aside, we actually did a, a a proof of concept of having this kind of like mixed reality green screen, uh, uh, you know, external camera, but using a drone. Oh wow, really? Uh, so that you could move the camera around. Uh, we we never got it fully working. <laughs> uh, one of the interesting learnings from that is like the SDK for those things. Those the ones that make them available with SDK yeah. basically have something at the beginning that says, "Hey, listen." Uh, you game developers, this you're flinging an op- object around with real mass, so you know uh, things are getting serious, <laughs> right? Uh, when when uh, stuff goes sideways, it really goes sideways. Um, so I, I think that uh, t- to your point, like you know, w- we spend a bunch of time doing kind of uh, let's say more active development in the client group, but there's still uh, a, a number of teams at Intel that are pretty involved in that kind of like world capture, three D capture. Okay. Uh, the the uh, team that develops the real sense uh, technology and set of cameras, uh, those are being applied in lots of domains like that. Whether it's like mounting them on the front of robots or in different uh, VR stuff, uh, there's an Intel uh, sports group that has like, as an example, like um, it's actually a good example. Like uh, when when uh, people first saw the lighthouse system that they'd come up with the with the vive with this kind of outside in tracking everybody got really uh excited for a while about inside out tracking saying look that nobody's going to want to have these devices around that are, uh, require these external sensors but there's lots of contexts where that absolutely works right we we have one uh, large scale deployment of external sensors that's worldwide which is called gps it's just not quite as precise as a lighthouse, right? right? <laughs> but it's like, that that's exactly what that is, right? And then uh, we've done something with our sports team where there are actual like arenas, sports arenas that are outfitted with these like huge arrays of cameras that they're doing like real-time capture from a, a wide array of points of view. I think it's like 32 stereo cameras <laughs> at like 4K. At, they capture the entire sports event and then they data crunch it into like a massive voxel field mm. using some you know uh, yeah, Intel uh, technology to do that. Uh, so that's an example of like something that for that particular context makes sense to use external high precision sensing, mm. right? Will we see those deployed in uh, shopping malls mm. or homes at one day? Like who knows? Mm-hmm. But it's an example of like, We'll see places where the the individual technologies work, and then people can learn from them and figure out what they want to do. Right? I'm sold. I'm ready for my Intel volumetric capture rig, and I'll just put it in these four corners here, and then I can AR project myself right beside you, and we can have this conversation face to face. All right. Well, well, you know, nothing nothing to announce this week. On that, <laughs> we'll see. Um. Okay. And I guess. I guess. I, uh, to close, uh, and yeah. we could go on forever, but uh, we do have to end at some point in time. And, and so I have these right. two kind of closing questions that are very general. They're not Intel specific. They're not even necessarily gaming specific. But I've heard you kind of talk a little bit about these things on some of your other talks, and I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear whether your thoughts have evolved. So the first one is... Um, and I've heard this thought repeated by multiple guests on this podcast as well, is that is that today's generation of kids just seem to be a lot more educated about technology and game design and gaming mm-hmm. and that kind of thing than ever before. You know, perhaps that is obvious as to why that might be. But I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about the ramifications of that. And like, again, if we're doing that kind of five, 10 year projection, you know, a kid who grew up, um, you know, today and lived through COVID and lived through smartphones and lived through UGC and lived through, you know, whatever, uh, building their own Minecraft server before they turned 10 and all of that sort of stuff. What does that do to kind of the next generation of entrepreneurs and grownups who are going to, you know, take over the world? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> they, um, you know, I, I think uh, in in some of the more wide-ended wide open areas uh, of questions like that. You, you, I think of it in terms of breadcrumbs, like what are the little clues mm-hmm. that we see around? And so uh, obviously examples like uh, Minecraft and uh, Roblox and what people are doing there, where 
I, I think, you know, there's one interesting trend, which is, you know, there are people that are obviously, you know, young, successful developers in the Roblox ecosystem that are making games that are resonating with that audience. That's kind of an obvious thing to come out of it. There's a kind of more interesting thing in terms of the the implications of of the usage of like um, uh, things being more ephemeral mm-hmm. uh, uh, kids jumping in and kind of surfing through ranges yeah. of games and not always going in to play the same one. They're like into, ex, you know, going with a group of friends yes. and experiencing fresh unknown stuff, even if it's a bit broken, yeah. Yeah. which is a little bit like the, the, the group version of what, you know, individually might be, I'm okay surfing through YouTube or TikTok, even though I know I'm going to get a lot of low quality yeah. stuff, yeah. I'm going to get like a lot of surprises that, uh, I wouldn't get if I, you know, tuned into NBC or uh, or or you know, went to see what's available on Netflix, mm. right? And those things will take their place in the ecosystem of games experiences that are available, and they'll be really high end, high polished stuff, and a lot of like, uh, you know, uh, 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 a friend of mine uh, referred to you know a lot of the Roblox experiences as kind of like playable memes. Yeah. Right, like just things that are gonna, you know, be really hot for a couple days, and and the thing people talk about, and then and then they bypass, mm-hmm. right? And uh, so I think that's interesting to think about. I don't know what it means for the industry. We'll we'll have to wait and see, but it's it's very cool to watch. I like I like what you I like how you put it that um, they it's almost like they're willing and able to explore more, maybe as a group. I'm wondering if there's this mm-hmm. sort of like collective digital bravery or you know like like where whereby they're they're more sure. they're more brave exploring the fringes of the internet as a group than maybe they would as an individual i'm just wondering if we're going to start to see yeah maybe that's a really uh that's a really intriguing idea another uh you know interesting uh case example this was like um a a, a a sentence that, or a, a, you know, an idea that a, a a tech lead at at Tencent told me one time over a lunch conversation that really struck with me was we were talking about like Twitch and game streaming mm-hmm. and 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 other services like that that are uh, you know popular in China and stuff, and uh, and he said yeah that you know the idea of like the few people that stream to millions is really interesting. I'm far more interested in the millions of people that stream to a few. Hmm. And this idea of like, uh, what if, you know, uh, FaceTime was, you know, uh, or, or an application like that, that you could quickly jump on a chat with three or four of your friends and stream to them, but do it in game or yeah. with your games experience. That's a very intriguing idea. Right. And then of course we saw uh, Epic do the like house party yes. integration, uh, and acquisition there. And so that's a, 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 a good breadcrumb in that direction. Right. And that'll mean like, I don't feel the need to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, get my millions of uh, of viewers to kind of give donations. No, I'm just kind of hosting a thing for a couple of my friends and, hey, watch me do this, mm-hmm. you know, uh, in the same way that you might have, you know, when we were kids said, you know, grab your BMX bike and put a piece of wood across a garbage can and say, watch this uh, before <laughs> you ended up in the hospital. <laughs> yeah, um, it's I, I guess I just want to close uh, with this quote of yours that I, I really liked, or it wasn't even a quote. It was, it was a line that really resonated, right? You talked about smartphones took off because they gave us superpowers. I, I thought that was, right. I thought that was perfect, right? And maybe people have said it before. I hadn't heard anyone say it exactly that way. And I thought that was a really good way of putting it. And I think that technology and again, you know, gaming as the sort of cutting edge of technology, especially for kids, is giving kids this whole other sense of superpowers, right? This whole other bucket of superpowers. And in five or 10 years, the things that they take for granted, um, I mean, forget, you know, forget the superpower of being able to, you know, immediately and instantly contact a single individual via text message, which was a superpower 10 years ago. Or now never being able to, never needing to remember someone's birthday because Facebook does it for you, which is a superpower that right. I wish I had growing up, right? It's fascinating to um, sort of ruminate on what those superpowers for kids in 10 years will will look and feel like. And I love the fact yeah, that I you're think, doing that, that you're someone in the industry. Yeah, I think that, that. the... Um, 
you know, to, to kind of close on, on that note, uh, we, we recently uh, got a, a new CEO, uh, Pat Gelsinger, who's a, uh, a, you know, an Intel veteran that left the company for a while and recently came back. And he's a real kind of technologist at heart. And, and uh, he's, he's been giving a lot of kind of internal talks of really, you know, passionately talking about how technology is magic. Mm-hmm. Right. And, uh, and, and it really, at the heart of it, that's what it is, right? So, so you know, I said that quote about phones, but it's really true about all of the ways in which this technology has come to, to people. We think about PCs as the kind of, uh, you know, workhorse, and I don't mean that just in kind of the office work kind of sense, but the, the kind of go-to platform for when people want to kind of uh, realize their their best selves, mm-hmm. at whether, uh, whether in a creative sense or in a sense of play, et cetera. The smartphones gave you kind of uh, uh, the world's data and the internet at your fingertips wherever you were. These other kind of um, you know AR and VR technologies and new uh, ways of getting games will do the same thing. It's all it's all magic, mm-hmm. right? And then what what spells the kids cast with it in the future is you know uh, I can't wait to see. Well, we'll see, right? We'll we'll close with I, I'm going to butcher it slightly, but the wonderful Arthur C. Clarke quote, right? And the any sufficiently developed technology is indistinguishable from magic. Boom. Yeah, I'd guess that I'd add uh, because it is. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, Kim. Right. Well, this has been a blast. It's been wonderful to catch up. It's been wonderful to hear about all the awesome stuff uh, that Intel is doing, that you're thinking about, um, the ways that you guys are sort of helping to kind of nudge or guide the gaming industry in one particular exciting direction. Uh, and and I, I hope you continue to do these thought exercises and share them with the industry because I, for one, find them fascinating. Yeah, yeah. thanks so much. It was great uh, being on. I'm uh, super glad you gave me the chance to do it and uh, look forward to you know getting together post-COVID in person and uh, sharing a beer yeah, or what have you. that'll be awesome. All right, All right thanks. Man, thanks, Bye. Kim. And that's a wrap for another uh, episode of the uh, Tomorrow with Rovio podcast. Uh, I'm your host, Ben Mattis. Uh, I want to thank Kim Pallister uh, from Intel for joining us today. Uh, I, I, I love Kim's way of thinking about the industry. I, I really enjoy the fact that Intel encourages him to do these sort of thought experiments about where gaming could go, what it could look like in five years, and, and almost to use that as a, as a sort of roadmap for the kinds of challenges that, that we as an industry need to explore and we need to solve in order to kind of push things forward. I personally find it very valuable. Hopefully, um, those of you listening to this podcast did as well. Uh, as always, if you enjoyed this, please don't hesitate to subscribe, share with your friends. Uh, you know, this is how it gets discovered, right? Word of mouth is the way that um, podcasts like this sort of uh, get found. Uh, and if you enjoyed it, maybe you know some people who enjoyed it as well. And of course, you know, I love doing this. I'd, I'd, I'd love to keep on doing it. And, and so if you guys enjoy it and want more of it, that, that's, that's a strong sign that we should keep on going. Uh, regardless, um, wherever you are, uh, I hope you have a wonderful evening morning, afternoon, whatever time it is for you. Thanks for tuning in. And uh, I guess we'll talk to you soon. Bye.